What would you do if you had the opportunity to interview Jesus? Pilate did. When Pilate was questioning Jesus, he asked, What is truth? Pilate never stuck around for the answer, but that should not stop us. We in our day can ask Christ the same question, What is truth? and go to the Word of God for our answer. The Pilot's Interview podcast will investigate the truths of the Word of God and host interviews or discussions with theologians, pastors, and historians. Today we'll be talking about the history, the themes, and the meaning of the genre of Christian music called Spirituals with Dr. Dickey. The Pilot's Interview podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Today we have the honor of hosting Dr. Thomas Taylor Dickey. Dr. Dickey holds doctoral and master degrees in orchestral conducting from the University of Georgia and Louisiana State University, respectively. And he graduated with the highest honors from Eastern Illinois University, where he received the Excellence in Fine Arts Scholarship. He has further studied conducting numerous workshops and master classes at the Prague Academy of Performing Arts, Cleveland Institute of Music, and Cincinnati Conservatory of Music, among others. Dr. Didge began piano studies at the age of four, following in the footsteps of Mozart, who began to learn to play at around the same age. He's won numerous awards for his work, including the 21st Century Prominent Musicians Award, the Artist of the Month Award from the European Classical Music Awards, and he was the Golden Prize winner of the 2022 Grand Maestro International Music Competition. Furthermore, Dr. Dickey has a wealth of experience, having conducted many professional orchestras throughout the United States and the world in places like England, where he worked with the London classical soloists. He's also worked with conductors such as Christopher Zimmerman and Diane Witchery. Dr. Dickey is a former director of orchestral activities at the University of wisconsin Platteville and the music director and conductor of the Debut Symphony Youth Orchestra and is currently the director of orchestral studies at Oklahoma State University, where he conducts the OSU Symphony Orchestra. And if you stay tuned for the whole interview, you'll hear something beautiful at the end. And now, without further ado, good afternoon, Dr. Dickey. How was your day and how are you doing? Hello, Christopher. Um, I'm very well, thank you. So glad to be here. That introduction was really quite something. I hope the listeners aren't going to be disappointed after they watch this podcast. But no, I'm I'm doing well. But at the same time, I'm very much looking forward to next week, which is going to be spring break uh, down here at Oklahoma State University. It's been one of those semesters where I feel as though I've been living out of a suitcase and in one state one week and in another another state another week and somehow trying to keep up my full-time job down here. So doing well, but very busy and looking forward to a little bit of R&R next week. That's wonderful, Dr. Dickey. That certainly makes sense. You know, I appreciate your services and I'm grateful that you've traveled sharing this beautiful art. And that is something we're going to get into today. As always, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 8 through 9, All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There's nothing forward or perverse in them. They're all plain to him that understandeth and right to them that find knowledge. Dr. Dickey, may you plainly tell us what kind of music do you live for? What music touches your heart in a profound way? Well, not to be cliche, but typically the pieces that I'm currently conducting those are the ones I'm um, feeling the most passionately about, you know, whether it's the pieces I was doing a couple of weeks ago with the Honors Orchestra in College Dale or the pieces that I'm working on with my college orchestra. It's what, you know, gets me up in the morning, but it's also what keeps me up at night. Uh, sometimes it feels like. Um, but I've been very fortunate that, you know, having such a strong keyboard background um, and, you know, a love of music and music ministry, I also have been a church organist for the past 16 years. And so, um, fun fact, there were two occasions in my life where I thought I was discerning um, a calling to seminary, that maybe I'd become Father Thomas, you know, and not Dr. Dickey. 
Um, but it was through my uh, time on the organ bench. So that's when I realized that's where my gifts are. They are not at the pulpit, uh, but they are at the organ bench. And so there's always something wonderfully filling, you know, on a Wednesday night choir rehearsal and a Sunday morning service of being at the bench and, you know, leading the congregational singing and accompanying the choir on the anthem that um, feeds my soul, you know, in a way that, though the orchestra, of course, feeds my soul, it just feeds it uh, in a different way or it's an extra helping of, you know, soul satisfaction, as it were. So I've been really fortunate, you know, to get to be nourished in, on so many different levels, orchestral and organ and whatnot. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Dickey. Indeed, music can reach the soul in a way unlike other mediums. And on that note, author Caitlin Greenridge, in her New York Times piece, Black Spirituals as Poetry and Resistance, describes spirituals as meditations on the triumph of the metaphysical over the physical realities of slavery. Dr. Dickey, what did you think of that quotation and... Can you please share the historical significance of spirituals? So I don't think I could have said it any better. I think that was a fantastic quote, uh, and it summarizes um, the significance uh, and the, all the goings-ons in spirituals, their histories, um, and how they're being utilized today. So I don't even want to dare touch that quote. It's fantastic. Bravo. What I can add to it, um, so the history of the spirituals actually goes back uh, to the 17th century and well through the mid part of the 18th centuries, um, starting first with the, uh, the transatlantic slave trade, unfortunately. And what we find in these spirituals are stories of the struggles, the hardships of slaveries, um, but also there are some work songs, some plantation songs, many of which are rooted um, in biblical narrative or drawing parallels between certain you know, slave figures then figures, especially from the Hebrew Bible, as it were. And fun fact, they were actually passed down orally, you know, from one slave to another for the first couple hundred years. It wasn't really until about the 1870s that these pieces started to be written down. And then, you know, in the following century were finally recorded, you know, it started to be performed uh, in front of audiences, as it were. Another fun fact, the spiritual is considered the first like signature genre of music here um, in the U.S., and there's a great orchestral composer you might have heard of, Antonin Dvorak, a Czech composer who actually came over to the United States for a couple of years, first to be the dean, I think, of the American Conservatory in New York City. And then he spent some time over in Iowa, where there is this random small town that has a very large Czech population. And when he was there, he was exposed to music um, of Native Americans um, and music of African Americans and was completely enamored, you know, with spirituals and other sorts of folk songs. And when asked if he had advice for young up and coming composers in America, he said, turn to the music of these people. There is great fodder, you know, in these in these songs. And so you think about the iconic Ninth Symphony, the New World Symphony of Antonin Dvorak. You know, proof is in the pudding. You know, there's such wonderful um, fodder in some of these spirituals. And I think you can say that, you know, in a lot of Dvorak's music, it has a certain either spiritual-like quality about it, or at least you can tell that it's rooted in folk song or some sort of, you know, sing-song narrative, at least. And so I think Dvorak's advice was really good. You know, turn to the music, you know, of Native Americans and African Americans, because um, the music that they were passing down orally for centuries, it's some fantastic music for sure. Dr. Dickey, I really appreciate that you shared the historical significance of the spirituals, because now we're going to look at their historical backdrop together, so we can see the themes and the messages contained therein. There are several well-known spirituals, such as Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, Take My Hand, Precious Lord, Steal Away to Jesus, Go Down Moses, and Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. Dr. Dickey, what themes from spirituals touch your heart the most? So your question reminds me of a story that Father Dan back at the University of Georgia Episcopal Center once told us. He said that there are three types of prayers. Wow, God. Thanks, God. And help, God. And I think there's a lot of similarities between uh, Father Dan's advice, you know, and the narratives that we find, you know, in spirituals, you know, either praising God giving thanks to God, or crying out for help um, from God. And I don't know if Father Dan meant it to be such a strong parallel, but ever since that chat I had with him probably, gosh, 10, 15 years ago, it has stuck with me ever since. And so every time either I'm programming a piece that's inspired by a spiritual, or if I'm at the organ console and I'm playing a spiritual at the organ, I always hear that you know line from Father Dan. I'm looking for aspects of where in the text 
you know, are we praising God, thanking God, and seeking help um, from God? So that that line has stuck with me ever since, and I've never not approached a spiritual in that same way ever since Father Dan's conversation with me, however many years ago that was. So it sounds like you had a very special connection with him. Are there any other things that you learned from him as a mentor? Oh, absolutely. So Father Dan, he had this wonderful, almost Jeff Foxworthy-like quality about him. Like He was from Georgia, had such a Southern accent, but was so rooted, so grounded down to earth. Um, and really related well to college students like that ministry, you know, at the um, basically being the chaplain at the college campus ministry was it was it was a perfect fit for him as well with us, with him and he with us. Um, and then the advice that he was able to give me about, you know, if I think I'm discerning a call to seminary, what, what that might feel like, um, what action might I take, how might I you know proceed with that? Um, so yeah, he was really incredibly formative, you know, in my you know very impressionable years back in college, you know, when I thought I might be discerning, you know, is it the organ bench? Is it the pulpit? Is it the conductor's podium? Father Dan, I'm not quite sure. And so I will forever be grateful, you know, for my time, my three years um, that I got to work with him as the organist um, at the University of Georgia Episcopal Center. I'm grateful you shared not only the themes that touched you, but even a bit of your journey and how you've incorporated them. In fact, I remember you just mentioned your college experience. I remember after I heard you conducting the college students, I got to hear their hearts play with such passion. And I remember that you told me that there's always something that a person can get out of music, like the spirituals that the students played. Dr. Dickey, what is your experience like working with students? And what are some of the themes that they take home with them? So let me reference that very concert and one of the rehearsals that we had before it. So we were working on Chorale for String Orchestra by Stella Sung. And of course, they were playing it, you know, very well, great notes, good rhythm, intonation was good, balance and blend was great. But it was just lacking that, you know, that extra, you know, that made it, you know, really come to life. Um, and I finally, I just stopped the orchestra and I said, do you all know the spiritual, my Lord, what a morning? And they looked at me like I had a third eye right around there. And I said, okay, I can tell you don't know what this spiritual, that spiritual is about. And so I literally got out my phone. Usually I'm a no phones allowed in rehearsal person, but I literally got out my phone and I pulled up the words and I read aloud um, the stanzas to my Lord, what a morning. And then I put my phone down and I said, let's try it again. And it was a whole other orchestra. It was a whole other piece of music. And after it was over, I said, you know, whether or not, you know, you can directly relate to that piece, to the stanzas of the spiritual, etc., it has to mean something to you. And if it doesn't, it's going to come across in your playing. And, you know, it was like a whole other ensemble, a whole other piece. Once they finally realized, you know, the words, my Lord, what a morning, my Lord, what a morning. Oh, my Lord, what a morning when the stars began to fall. And we, you know, we took a moment to have a little conversation of, I'm sure you've all had a moment, maybe early in the morning at some point of the day, and you just looked up and thought to yourself, wow. What a blessing to be alive. What a great day this is. You know, thanks be to God for all that I have in my life. You know, and you just took that moment, you know, to acknowledge what you have, give thanks for what you have, and then you go on about your day. And I hope that the students took away that memory for sure. And I hope that whatever pieces they play, whether they're inspired by spirituals or the just, you know, standard symphonic repertoire, I hope that they will always seek that extra connection to the piece. That way, when they go back to play it again, you know, they're not just playing notes and rhythms and dynamics, you know, that they're actually taking that to that next step of really bringing art, you know, to life, making the music, you know, go that extra level, as it were. Dr. Dickey, we've now arrived at our final question. Spirituals are regarded as a genre of music that articulates suffering, longing, and religious passion. Dr. Dickey, how have spirituals guided your own religious passion or spiritual work? Ooh, well, I'm so glad we saved the most difficult question for last, uh, Christopher. Um, if I'm being you know, perfectly honest, every time I play, especially being more of an organist, not so much as an orchestral conductor, but I do take the time, you know, to read every line of every stanza, you know, to really understand the narrative, you know, of the hymn or the hymns across the service, going for bigger picture connections, as it were, you know, 
Side note, I'm I'm that organist who hates it when people skip verses. Like, we're going to sing hymn number whatever, but only one in five. Like, no, you're missing out on the best part. Like, that's where we get to the crux of it. Um, or it might be uncomfortable to sing that line, but you got to go through that uncomfort. That way, when you get to the final verse and it ends exclamation point, you know why it ends that way. And so I've always thought that there's something incredibly intrapersonal, but also interpersonal, you know, in spirituals, because, you know, obviously as a white man, I cannot relate to the struggles of slavery, but I can relate to the idea of someone just standing out, looking up at the sky, you know, and giving thanks to God or calling out for God. Or I think we've all had that day where we've said to ourselves, oh my gosh, what I'm going through right now, there's no one else who could possibly understand what I'm going through except Jesus um, or something like that. I think it's all those iconic spirituals that you reference in your questions. I think we've all at least had one moment or if we paused and allowed ourselves to think back, we would find at least one moment where we have thought to ourselves, my Lord, what a morning or nobody understands what I'm going through except Jesus. I feel like I'm all alone in this world. I'm all alone in these trials and um, struggles but I've also thought that there's this wonderful celebration of community, you know, that communal experience, you know, either the communal struggle, the communal journey, um, or the communal celebration um, that I think we all can relate to, whether it's, you know, whether or not we were alive in the 17th and 18th centuries, or whether, you know, we, you know, have suffered, you know, bondage and slavery. I think there's something that we all can relate to, you know, that communal experience, you know, this earthly journey that we're on. And ever since, you know, I'll, I'll go back to Father Dan once again, you know, I've never not approached a hymn and read all the lines or like the spiritual that we played with the orchestra. I've never not taken the time to look up the words to what they are, especially when you don't have the words to fall on when it's just orchestra. Um, I think it's, you know, paramount. Um, you reference the spiritual, um, nobody knows the trouble I've, I've seen. Uh, there was a great composer, Clarence Cameron White. Uh, he was a fantastic Black violinist and composer of the previous century, and he set four of those spirituals uh, for orchestra. And my college orchestra down here in Oklahoma, we played them um, back in 2019, and it was a wonderfully poignant moment um, for the audience, you know, for the orchestra, because not only does he just capture so well the text, he captures it without relying on the text. You know, he found a way to use orchestral instruments, you know, to bring words alive in a way that the words themselves alone um, couldn't. And I'll throw out, you know, another famous quote, you know, Martin Luther once said something, you know, in translation, of course, without music, man is little more than a stone. Um, and so I think whether you're thinking, you know, Lutheran chorales and Bach cantatas or, you know, um, African-American spirituals in 21st century orchestral music, you know, without all of that, we're just a bunch of stones. Um, and we need this, you know, to be more than that. So that's really informed how I approach, you know, music, my understanding of it, my understanding of text, and then my understanding of, so what happens when we don't have words to rely on? We've got to bring them out without using words, as it were. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Dickey. It was an absolute joy. And to our listeners, thank you for taking the time to search with us for the truth on Pilot's Interview. You can find Dr. Dickey's website, his credentials, a sample of his clinical, conductoral work, samples of famous spirituals, and a link to the Christ Jesus Ministries merch store in the description. Please share and subscribe to the Pilots Interview Podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Oh, yes, Lord. Sometimes I'm almost to the ground. Oh, yes, Lord. Oh, 
trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. If you get there before I do, oh yes, Lord, tell all my friends I'm a coming to. The trouble I've seen, nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory.